Now let's put our hands together and welcome uh, Mr. Pang. Hmm? Same surname as me. I will talk to you uh, about AIIB. This is a topic that I think a lot of people will be interested. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, a very good afternoon to everybody. Okay, I'm talking about the. Uh, oh, actually, not this title. Uh, <laughs> I changed my title a little bit. Okay, actually, the title, as you can see in what is circulated, is Urbanization, Infrastructure, and the BRI. Also, what is BRI? That's the Belt Road Initiative, or, or what is known as One Belt, One Road. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a power engineer by training. All right, and then uh, by practice for first part of my career. And I'm now a banker, so I came in a suit. I realized I'm the most formal person here, so I better take it off. <laughs> All right, uh, the, the work that I do has to do with infrastructure. My passion is for urbanization. So I'm talking about that. I hope to impress you that there is a world that is out there that is infrastructure and urbanization that is dominating out there. I hope you could realize it. And uh, in, I, I attended the last uh, OSG meeting and they were talk, uh, the talks were about technology and so on and so forth. I find that very exciting. I was in a startup before. Uh, but I hope you could also see the big, bigger picture of infrastructure and urbanization and how your technology could fit into all those stuff, right? People ask me, what's the relationship between infrastructure and urbanization? Is urbanization power infrastructure or are infrastructure supposed to support uh, urbanization? It is both. It is both, actually. So, and it's very difficult to separate these two very important things in our life that's happening around us. We have the electricity with us, we have the water with us, we have the ground that we stand on that's being prepared. All these are infrastructure, and that's part of urbanized environment. So, the, my first question, anybody can recognize this picture? No? I'm sure you could, right? That's, that's what? New York. Huh? Uh, New York City, the famous New York City. Eight point something million population. It's a big deal for bankers like us. Why? GDP of uh, 1.3 trillion on a population of 8 million people. You can imagine what the hell are the bankers earning? So much money is in there. All right, that's a world of opportunity in the urbanized world. Why is the urbanized world so powerful? The most number of connections, the most number of relationships, the most number of value add of the individual. That's what happens. The infrastructure brings people together. Urbanization brings people together. The closer we are, the greater value we create, we co-create with each other. That's what's happening. All right? So you have to think of infrastructure about the connectivity dimension. Times Square, exciting stuff, because we connect with people. All right, that's maximum connection. And one of the most important connections is the airport. The airports around New York, three of them, JFK, New York, and... Uh, I lost. Uh, what's the third one? Anyway, they bring about 120 million passengers per year. 120 million passengers per year traveling in and out of New York. Okay? And that is quite intense from all of us who study urbanization will know that these are important activities that drive the world's economy. If New York shuts down tomorrow, we are dead here. Okay? Because your US dollars you know, stop flowing and a lot of things will stop, you like it or not. And where is this place? Shanghai, of course. Our beloved Shanghai, we're so close to it. That is the New York equivalent here in China. Guess what is the population? Anybody? 28 million. 28 million compared against 8 million of New York. So much more populated. And let me tell you, I was first in Shanghai, or, or I first started working near Shanghai in uh, 1996. It was a quarter, not even a quarter of that kind of development, and certainly the population is way below that. All right? When we lose to look at uh, Putong, nothing is in Putong. It's a 
It's just farmhouses. But the speed that uh, the rate of in, uh, urbanization that is going up, the increase in population in Shanghai is 20, the, 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 the average it grows is as 22% versus New York is growing at 0.9% in terms of population. So there's a lot of opportunities that's growing on in the urbanization in China, in cities like Shanghai. Look at the complexity of Shanghai's roads. Sometimes, I actually, I don't understand how people can drive in Shanghai. Again, the connections, the airport connection, it has two airports. All right. This two airport incidentally carries a volume almost equivalent to that of New York, about 120 million. And that's all in two decades of work versus New York has established over decades. That's the growth of Shanghai. What do we see in such things? I want you all to think, what are the opportunities that presents to us at fast growing rate, high volume of transactions? What is happening out there? What is happening out there? And this is our beloved Singapore. I hope you still recognize the ironing board and the, and the, and the wheel. <laughs> okay, so you see that uh, our beloved Singapore, I always like to show uh, HDB houses it's because uh, I, my family, I brought up my family uh, and that's in, a, in a HDB and I, I really think that HDB is the most wonderful thing in, in the world where 80% of Singapore's population uh, uh, resides on HDB. It's one of its success. Going from <coughs> 1965 of 428 GDP per person per capita in 2013 is 55 rank number one in Asia. Sorry, the data is a little late, but we we still rank number one in Asia, number four in the world per capita. Why? It's about intensity. It's about people coming together. It's about you and me coming closer together to work. I go back to that point. So infrastructure and urbanization brings about such growth. And there'll be much more growth. Changi T5 is bigger than the, 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 the at that time of uh, three terminals combined. That's the kind of uh, development that we are going at. So we're now talking about growth. Growth of cities are very important. And worldwide growth, urbanized population. By 2050, 68% of all pop worldwide population will be urbanized. Okay, uh, that is uh, uh, a significant portion. Right now, we are about 54. Okay, and this will bring a lot of opportunities across the group. And the you can see the darker green. They will be larger than, but less than double. Uh, that means there's more than one time of growth in the larger green areas. And in the, in the orange areas, uh, there are actually five-fold or more growth in urbanized of population. Lots of growth worldwide in this uh, phenomena. How about in Asia? In Asia, the infrastructure growth is uh, estimated that every year, there will be one trillion worth of infrastructure uh, development, one trillion. And that one trillion, uh, mainly in a few areas, eh? in the energy areas, as well as uh, in, the, uh, in the transport area. In the energy areas, let's analyze this important set of, of data. China, is, has right now the largest population and therefore the energy consumption. If you look at USA, it's about two, uh, two uh, trillion, uh, two thousand gigawatts behind, two thousand gigawatts behind, and Singapore is in a range of forty-seven gigawatts, and Myanmar is eleven. The rank on the extreme left is where we are as far as the uh, amount of energy being generated is concerned. Okay. If you realize that 
if China's energy consumption were to come from 4,000, somewhere closer to US 12,000, the amount of energy that it requires is going to jump enormous. Look at the energy per capita of China is so small. And then you start to compare against countries like Myanmar. Every person only consumes 22 watts, kilowatts per hour. 22. It's not even one Singaporean's uh, one day amount of energy. All right, that is what is the current situation. Why? Countries are, have so much differential. It has to do with urbanization. It has to do with sufficiency of infrastructure. Worldwide, there is will only grow. Both the developed countries and the developing countries will need further and further infrastructure. There is this addiction to infrastructure, including energy. All right? and, and if you look at Myanmar, Myanmar is a country where three quarters of the whole country are not even connected to electricity. Three quarters. Can you imagine the amount of investment opportunities that you can put in to make the life of the average Burmese better? Three quarters. So, i uh, do a bit of advertisement. Eh? AIB recently invested on a power plant uh, of uh, uh, 312 million in Myanmar. We're trying to up the accessibility of power. These are opportunities for us to value it to people out there. There's also uh, uh, third-tier cities that are also moving along. For example, Chongqing uh, now ranks the top-performing uh, municipal of China because these are cities that are also growing. So you're not looking at just megos, uh, mega cities, you're not just looking at developing world, you're also looking at uh, cities of medium sizes. So all these are happening and uh, probably there'll be a lot of opportunities for all of you, including the Raffles Medical. <laughs> Suzhou Industrial Park, I, I speak fondly of this because I spent uh, uh, four, four months of uh, my precious uh, youth uh, looking at uh, Suzhou Industrial Park. These are development of its own that makes uh, a huge contribution to China. I see it as to China because it's the first and exemplary industrial park uh, of China even now, till now. And it is uh, done by a Singapore uh, uh, Suzhou collaboration. And there will be new cities coming up. For example, this is Amravati, new capital in the province of uh, Andhra Pradesh in India. A brand new capital. And guess what is the size? It's going to be 700 square kilometers, the size of Singapore. Okay, the startup area is uh, six square kilometers, but the size of it, uh, I, I was quite heavily involved in the master planning. So the, in terms of vast two, north, east facing is the best. Uh, so this is the, the, the spine, the triangle that faces a river, and the river is supposed to bring money uh, from the vast two perspective. So these are, these are exciting things about development. You can see that these are things that uh, we can, using your expertise in whichever field that you are, a lawyer, a technology person, a medical person, you can value it. This is uh, Kigali uh, in uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, another city that is coming up in Africa. So don't just set sight on Asia, there are also other continents that is moving. What's the feature about <coughs> of uh, infrastructure and urbanization. The problem with it is, yes, long gestation and high risk. Very long period of development and high risk. Huge amounts of money and sometimes it goes to waste. That's the problem. That is from the company perspective, that's from a country perspective. And let me tell you, it also goes from an individual perspective. You may involve in a project that tomorrow that, that wouldn't take off. All right, so that is the kind of risk even at the individual level we are, in, we are experiencing. Huge investment. The amount of money that is being moved is a lot. Good and bad. 
Just now I talked about high risk. That means if you lose the investment, it's going to be a big, big deal. All right. The, 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 the good part is that if you're just taking a fraction of those uh, investments, you actually make a lot of money. All right. These are collaborative platforms. Once again, I, I said that it's about bringing people together. Infrastructure is about bringing people together. It's enabling the, the coming together of people. There are constant changes in the macro trends and regional politics as because of infrastructure and urbanization. And that's where I want to talk about the BRI or the One Belt, One Road. This is <coughs> the old Silk Road, which is the One Belt, and the Maritime Route, which is the One one road. Don't ask me why it's not the other way around. Huh? I, I can't explain. <laughs> In any case, this is the old Silk Road. Guys, can you remember the old Silk Road that you studied in your history? Remember? The old Silk Road belongs to whom? It started in China, but belongs to everybody. You go into the Museum of Afghanistan, you see, you see the, uh, the, the artifacts from uh, Europe, from China. You go to Turkey, you find the artwork of Chinese as well. And it's like everybody is exchanging everything. The old Silk Road is a collaborative platform. Same for the Maritime Silk Road. Why did the old Silk Road fail? Anybody? Why did the old Silk Road fail? Because it's overtaken by the Sea Road, which is cheaper. All right? Cheaper. Because the camels can't grow bigger, but the ships can grow bigger. All right. As at now, the cost, if you write through the, the famous, uh, right now, the, the uh, uh, Western <coughs> Connection Highway that China has built, from here to Europe costs 9,000 US dollars to, to bring a 20-foot container out to Europe. The cost of bringing it through the, the Suez Canal is uh, in the range of 3,000. It's still about one-third. Okay? Why is the Chinese coming out of One Belt, One Road uh, initiative? It is clear that China as a superpower is growing and it's exerting its power through its infrastructure. It's taking strategic objectives along the Silk Road. In Pakistan, the Djibouti port, uh, oh sorry, the, uh, oh no, I'm forgetting the names. Anyway, uh, so there are many areas of Strategic points that the, uh, the Chinese is, uh, so Guada, sorry, that's Guada, and then here is Djibouti. So these are ports, positions that Chinese are establishing themselves. All right, and in Sri Lanka as well, but Sri Lanka is a bit more controversial. You know what happened in Sri Lanka? So the Chinese uh, influenced the, the, uh, uh, the Sri Lankan to to build a mega port. And in this mega port, it's, it's a wonderful port concept. All right, but unfortunately, it played into the politics of the local, local people and they got objection. So these are things that the Chinese are also facing, the political objection. And in the latest, if you read yesterday's newspapers in uh, China Daily, the Maldives, the Maldives uh, on this side, uh, the Chinese was, uh, and the Indians were, were challenging each other in terms of influence. So there is a changing political landscape associated with infrastructure as well. And that's what you need to know. Things are not so straightforward when it comes to mega projects. All right? So this Belt Road Initiative covers 65% of the world's population. All right, uh, with more than 68 countries. Oh, please don't quote me on these 68 countries because I read literature also on 85, 70 something, and uh, in the in terms of other uh, literature, it varies. Huh? So it is a very inclusive concept. Huh? <laughs> so it ranges. So the scope covers from infrastructure all the way to cultural exchange, and you see, you can see a China role putting aside the 900 billion 
pushing ahead with this, using his political influence to set up connections using this. So the Chinese have a different way of engaging the world now with the Belt Road Initiative. And we should watch. We should watch and be, even be involved if you can. Well, this is one example of uh, China influencing, uh, uh, exerting, using his technical skills all right, to help the Indonesians to build up their railway system all right, from, uh, from uh, Bandung to, to Jakarta. There will be changes in, immediate, in your immediate climate as, an, as infrastructure and, in, and urbanization happens. This is the, the famous 1952 London smog. Because of the huge, intense industrialization of, of London, the visibility in, in, uh, in winter dropped to one meter in London. 12,000 people were killed, massive exodus out of London. So when, when urbanization and infrastructure happens, in an unplanned fashion, it actually would cause harm to itself. So environment is affected by us doing all this work. And if you are uh, 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 a person that is affected by these environmental changes, you will respond accordingly. So how you will you respond is what the urban scientists always studies. Okay, For us, we need to know that the infrastructure affects our life. It affects our life on the environment, as a, the, the physical environment. It also affects us in our social environment. For example, we have affordable housing in Singapore, and therefore our ratio mix is uh, much better. It also affects our economic environment. So when things go wrong, economic, uh, it, the economy gets affected. The <coughs> The famous uh, uh, pollution in Beijing, where we are. Those of us who have stayed here more than one year would know that this year's climate uh, is, is a huge blessing. Okay? This year's air is so clean. All right, don't you feel? Anybody disagree? We'll have, we can have a great talk. This year's air is so clean, we get to see blue sky. All right, so what is happening? It doesn't come by miracle. Huge amount of resettlement of industries that is uh, along the rustic belt of uh, China has been moved out. Okay, huge amount of uh, a, a, a re, re, uh, recalibration of its own heating sources and so on and so forth uh, has happened. I I'm proud to say again, advertisement time. Uh, uh, we, we are funding uh, a Beijing air quality uh, improvement and co-replacement project. Uh, AIB is funding. Uh, what happened is 500 over 1,000 families changed from coal heating into gas heating. That is the kind of work that is going on right now. AIB is proud to be a part of it. Uh, can you imagine if average family burns four to five tons of coal in a heating season. For those of us who come from Singapore, we don't appreciate it because we never heat coal in our, we never burn coal in our family. Four to five tons. There's a lot. There's a lot to contribute to the air. There are a lot of opportunities coming from uh, a uh, urbanization and infrastructure. If you could recall the good old days of uh, uh, Sir Stanford Raffles, who founded Singapore. How was uh, Singapore's existence came about? We came about replacing Malacca. All right, so there is this famous sea road that is part of the Maritime Silk Road that runs through Malacca Straits. So Sir Stanford Raffles thinks that well, there's an opportunity to offset Malacca, which was at that time controlled by the Dutch. So he set up a post here, a trading post here, with zero taxes, a free port, to capture Malacca's position. Simple. As I said, the rest is history. All right. 
So there are talks that tomorrow Penang can be one that can offset us. I don't know. Tomorrow there can be a, a canal through uh, uh, Thailand and uh, bypass us. I don't know. Tomorrow Sea Road can go up to the North Pole and Singapore can be bypassed. I don't know. So there are lots of opportunities as moving on in this infrastructure space. And it will change your life. And what is this? The threads. Anybody recognize this place? Actually, it's Detroit. Detroit in the 1950s and 1960s is the car factory of the world until the Japanese came. All right, the Japanese came, they are not productive enough, and billions of dollars of uh, infrastructure and urbanization go to waste. Factories were, were given up, Inf infrastructure was uh, 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 discarded. All right, so there are threads that is moving on. All right, the, by the way, the population of uh, Detroit dropped from almost close to of 2 million Right now, it is about 600,000, more than half. Okay, so it's a very cruel world in infrastructure and urbanization. So what does it mean to you? Actually, I'm not going to answer this question. It's up to you to go and interpret. Be it in your career, uh, be it in your personal life. There are lots of space to, to contribute. There are lots of space to... Uh, uh, value add and benefit from it, but there are also potential that you might fall victim to a larger infrastructure trend. With that, I thank you.